Rob, activate. Rob, make me coffee. Rob, pay my mortgage. Rob, do something. So uh, today everybody was getting excited because Nintendo announced that they were going to release basically a miniaturized version of the NES that you could uh, play 30 particular games on. It was kind of like a packaged emulator thing and everybody's freaking out. Oh, it's nostalgia. It's going to be so cool. The thing is so cute, etc. And it's true, right? The thing looks really, really nice. Uh, but when I saw it, I thought, hey, man, I'm not going to buy that thing. It's just an emulator with 30 games on. Like, I can build that. I mean, anybody can build that. Um, and that got me thinking, like, you know, if I were to do one of these emulator, you know, 30 games inside a thing or, you know, some number of games inside a cute thing, what would you do? And then it struck me, oh, man, there is the perfect thing. You can put a turn into a Nintendo console to plug into your TV. And that is this guy, right? So this is Rob, and we'll go into what makes Rob special in a moment. But I'm sure that you know... Uh, that Rob is super iconic, right? He stars in Super Smash Brothers. He's been in all kinds of things. He's got a uh, <clears throat> Number of kind of guest appearances on a lot of uh, Nintendo products and he's never really done anything right like hey He kind of looks cute and there were two games for him and that's it Wouldn't it be amazing if we could take Rob and essentially put him next to your TV plug him in with HDMI and then play NES games directly on him, right? And so I'm going to show you how to do that today so that you can do it yourself. This is going to be the core of our project. This is a Raspberry Pi Zero. Uh, this little thing is essentially a, a, a full Linux computer. Uh, it has got everything mounted on the single sock here, the single chip. Uh, this is basically a one gigahertz ARM core together with 512 megabytes of RAM. Uh, and so the way to think about this in terms of computing power is this little device basically has the same computing power as a Retron 5. Uh, which is that kind of multi-card machine made by Hypergen. Uh So this should be more than enough to run our uh, NES games on it. Um, the nice thing about the uh, Raspberry Pi Zero is that it's got HDMI out, so we will have nice high-quality video going out. Uh, and then we've got two of these micro USB sockets here. Uh, this one is used to feed power to the board, so it takes 5 volts and it runs off that. Uh, and then this one is used for USB input, so we're going to put a little USB hub onto here so that we can plug in our uh, uh, NES style USB controllers and then this slot here is for the uh, Disk so for storage the Raspberry Pi uses a uh, micro SD card um, You write your Linux operating system on here You kind of pop it in there and now you can boot this. This is a full computer now You might be thinking oh boy Linux that sounds super hard and you have to be a hardcore nerd to understand how that works well um, as it turns out, if you want to do retro gaming on a Raspberry Pi, there is a group which releases a special distribution of the operating system called RetroPie. And the cool thing about RetroPie is you download the uh, SD card image, uh, you basically burn it onto this card, and when you boot up, it's got all the emulators and stuff we'll need just running. So it's super, super handy, uh, and we'll show you how to get that running uh, in a minute. What I'm thinking is we are going to essentially uh, take Rob here, and we are going to... Uh, install the Raspberry Pi Zero, which is pretty small, probably somewhere in the base, uh, and then we'll put um, USB ports at the front of him so we can plug our controllers in somehow, and then put HDMI at the back and a power in. Uh, and that's kind of he'll run, and maybe we'll put some LEDs in the head to show power to show that he's actually turned on something cool. Um, so the first thing we've got to do is take Rob apart and uh, make sure there's enough space to do everything inside. Okay, I've never taken one of these apart before, so I'm just going to get into it and then we'll see what we find as we go. Um, so, yeah, he was powered completely by uh, batteries, so double A's, what, four of them? Oh, this thing must have eaten through batteries really fast because it's the pieces are quite heavy and it's all driven by motor, so this can't have lasted very long. Uh, it's got this quite cool flippy AT switch, which we'll try and keep. That's nice and retro. Uh, this cable is quite nice. I don't know if we'll end up using it or not. Uh, if it gets in the way, we might end up removing that. Um, all right, let's start taking them apart. Let's see what happens. There we go. Okay. Lots of interesting things happening in here. Okay, so save that. We're probably going to reuse it. Uh, okay, let's see what we got. So this is the battery holder. We're not going to use that because we're not going to power our uh, machine off of batteries. So I'm actually going to snip that. Oh. 
I can probably save this for another project. Oh boy. Don't know if you can see, but uh, look at all the uh, corrosion on that. Somebody burst the battery inside this poor guy. Uh, okay, let's see. So we have got some kind of control circuit board here, and there is at least one motor here. Uh, and it looks like that's it. Let's uh, let's take it apart some more. <clears throat> what do we got behind this circuit board? Okay, so this is the telephone cable, which has got a nice little plug. Is it a plug? Yeah, it is, but it's really in there. All right, we'll leave it for now. I want to save this switch, so we're probably going to keep this piece somehow. Uh, I'll probably cut this PC board around so I can keep the screw hole so everything remains in place. Uh, there are some interesting chips and things going on in here, so uh, let's see. Um, this was an uh, RFC CPU 10, it's a 8652, so that's actually a processor. Uh, that's probably what did the decoding of the uh, the decoding of the uh, video signals. It's this kind of long chip here. Uh, and then we got three smaller ones, which are sharp IRC 2C25, it's labeled 8708, These are probably memory, would be my guess. And then some kind of passives here for doing, you know, filtering control and voltage and all that. Um, this is a limit switch, which has fallen out of here somewhere. It obviously is to tell the device when Rob has hit one of his rotation limits or something. All right, let's keep going. Okay, let's see what this is. Oh, it's a gearbox. How cute. So you've got a gear here, and then over here you've got another gear, which is what controls the arms. Um, that's pretty nice, actually. Um, so I guess if we open this up, we'll be able to see all the gears and make it up. Uh, it's always a bad idea to open up gearboxes because a thousand gears always flip everywhere and you kind of struggle to put them back. But, uh, you know, for the sake of understanding how Rob was put together, uh, let's see what... Uh, Let's see what we got here. So that explains how he goes side to side, but I wonder how they do him going up and down. There must be something inside the shoulder joint. Uh, I was kind of hoping not to take the shoulder joints apart because I don't want to do anything there. We're going to install all the electronics down here, but anyway. All right, let's see. Oh, that's quite cute, actually. It's a pretty simple little gearbox. Um, so this is the motor, the electric motor. If you owned any toys in the 80s, like cars or whatever, they all had the same kind of motor with this kind of flat surface here. And as that spins, it turns all of these guys here. And uh, eventually it gets driven out of there. Very cute. It seems to have an anti-backlash story happening here. Is that what that is? Yeah. So that if a... Uh, the anti-backlash thing is so that when you are rotating a, a heavy piece, when the motor stops, it tends to kind of want to wobble and snap. So by putting a spring inside the gearbox, it absorbs it, and so it tends to, you know, move in a kind of more controlled way. Very cool. These cables, uh, I, it looks like they go up into the head. So, you know, I was thinking of putting some nice LEDs here as power lights so that when he's running, uh, we've got like red lights behind the eyes. So I'll probably use this cable to do that. That way I don't have to run my own cable through. We'll just reuse this one. And how much we've got? One, two, three, four cables. That's plenty. We're going to use basically just plus five and, uh, and ground for that. So that should be fine. Uh, okay. So now I'm actually going to take apart his head because I do want to put the, uh, I don't want to put, uh, I want to put the LEDs in there. I kind of on the fence as to whether I should take apart his shoulders or not because I want to get this out, this phone cord, and the clean way to do it would be to open this up. So okay, let's open it up, we'll see what's in there, hopefully we don't break it. I've got screws here, I'm saving everything so we can put it all back. Uh, it actually, the screws came out very cleanly. It's super good quality plastic, this is really nice stuff actually. Um, it's one thing about Nintendo is like the physical build quality is amazing, you know, long before uh, Apple was building all the nicest stuff on the block. Nintendo really had their thing going. All right, let's keep going. All right, so let's do it like this so that if something falls, we don't lose everything. Oh, whoa. There is a lot going on in here. That's amazing. All right, let me, uh, let me get the camera a little closer so I can show you what's going on. So inside here, we have just so much stuff going on. So we have got uh, 
two of those motors over here and they've got some resistors here to lower the voltage that's going to them and then each of them is driving uh, this gearbox here which eventually um, it's a massive reduction gearbox like this motor has to turn a lot to move this a tiny bit and you can see as I turn this like quite a lot oops popped off um, the uh, other gears barely turn at all you see this is what I mean about taking gearboxes apart uh, and ultimately all this is uh, reduced and then translated into this gear here which connects up with um, oh wait, just the wrong side connects up with this one and so these gears on this side mesh together with that wheel and that's how we do the open and close the arms action so um, something that's very cute here actually is um, these two gears are color coded right one is red and one is green for left and right um, I guess assembling these people must have driven themselves crazy. Like, hey, where, which gear goes where? I don't understand. So they did that, which is pretty cute. Okay, so now we have access to the telephone cord. Uh, oh, motor's coming out. Actually, maybe I'll pull the motors out. I probably reuse them for something. There's another one of those limit switches. So I think what I'll do is there's nothing going to be going on up here in the shoulder piece in our, uh, in our project. But um, what I'll do is I'll remove the gears just so nothing rattles around. And I'll probably just um, use a little bit of hot glue to keep the arms in place so that they don't kind of flop around. But other than that, we'll keep everything uh, as is. So I'm going to start closing that up. Wow, this must have been just so expensive to design. Cool, very cool. Okay, so I just put some tape here to hold this in place. Uh, and now for the head. And it turns out you can kind of slide this completely out somehow. There we go. Okay. So, uh... Oh, that feels like it's got a motor in there. I didn't realize that uh, Rob would move his head up and down. That's cool. All right, let's pop it open and see what happens. Oh, oh, there wasn't a motor. It's just got uh, these kind of uh, springs to keep it nice and uh, tight. That's good because I held it uh, in place for about 30 years. Okay, so now back here there is also a uh, circuit board of some kind. And this is the kind of optic sensor bit. Um, very very simple it's just got that actually the optic sensor is just on this one eye but I really want the light to shine on both so I think what we are going to do is probably uh, drill that out and then add one LED on each side and uh, that way it'll look really cool when it's running it'll look like uh, you know it's got little glowing eyes it'll look a little alive so in terms of electronics what we have got here is pretty simple uh, here's the LED at the top um, which I won't use because we're going to use the eyes. I don't want to have too many LEDs. It's just going to look silly. Uh, over here. Oh, interesting. Ha. Huh. That's cool. So this is a sharp IR3T07 chip in there. Uh, if you can see, it's kind of got a funny shape. Uh, that is the same chip that Nintendo used inside the, uh, the Zapper, the light gun. So it's nice. They're reusing the technology. Uh, pretty cool idea. Uh, okay, so what I'm gonna do then is I will probably remove this PC board uh, to make space to put our LED and stuff in there uh, and I'll use these cables um, to get 5 volts from the bottom. Uh, so I think I'll probably do the headpiece first um, and then we can kind of close it up and go for a work from top to bottom. That'll probably be easiest. All right, so I'm going to drill out this eye here so we can put the second light in. I'm using a half-inch spade bit on my regular drill. These things work really well for cutting large holes. Uh, let's see. I need to do this gently so we don't crack the plastic. Oh, dear. Gently, I said. And there we go. Eh, not too bad. So on the bench power supply, I've got uh, set 5.3 volts, which is what our circuit is going to run on. That's what the Raspberry Pi likes. Uh, and at the bottom here we are going to see how many milliamps the circuit draws so let's turn it on there we go our two LEDs are shining uh, let me blind the camera by uh, shining that right in it, they are incredibly bright actually uh, and you can see down here that we are uh, generating 24 milliamps or we are drawing sorry 24 milliamps of power in the circuit so that's exactly right let's figure out how to put this inside the head so it ended up being harder than I thought to get the uh, lights in the eyes right. Not because of the uh, electronics or positioning them, but just because they were so bright. So uh, in the end, what I decided to do was I took some uh, spare labels, which I had from building mini machines, 
and I just printed solid red on them to kind of make like a filter uh, and stuck that behind the lens here so now what you end up with is a kind of nice even glow uh, the thing that's cool about this is actually that it also makes it kind of glow, uh, light up in an even way so that gives you a nice uh, kind of you know red glowing eyes so everything is going to fit which is good uh, we are going to take this which is the original uh, PC board from the base uh, I'm going to rescue the switch and we're going to uh, put it back uh, in its place here and that's going to be the power switch uh, it just looks really cool in that space uh, so what I'll probably do is I will save that screw post uh, and then kind of just trim this PC board over here and then uh, add some glue if I have to so that'll be that then for the actual main part of it uh, the back converter will be up here somewhere I'm going to put the uh, jack for power in this little corner here uh, the USB fits here fine what I'll do is I'll trim off this uh, fourth one we're not gonna need it so what I'm gonna end up doing is I'll put a uh, 802.11 Wi-Fi dongle in the center one and that'll be your two uh, gaming ports and they'll go here facing the front so it's nice and easy to plug your uh, controllers in then the Pi itself will go here the Pi is tiny but unfortunately all these cables that you have to have are just so huge and stiff so uh, the USB cable will just kind of coil it up and it'll be there. The HDMI will kind of make it do a little pigtail like that and it'll be pointing out the back uh, like that so that you will plug in your uh, HDMI in the back of the ROB so it doesn't look too ugly. Uh, so then what we need to do now is once everything is kind of in place uh, we'll kind of start gluing things into place and then I'm going to actually cut holes in this uh, plastic here which of course is going to end up looking ugly right because you can't cut the exact beautifully square holes for this and you can't cut this material uh, ABS using something like the laser because it produces toxic fumes so what we're going to do is kind of rough cut it using the Dremel and then I will 3D print a faceplate to make it look kind of smooth and nice uh, and we'll do the same for the back and hopefully that'll look good Uh, here are the two pieces that we 3D printed then for uh, doing the USB hub at the front for plugging in the controllers. There's this piece which um, will be used to hold the actual USB hub in place. And then there is this which is the, uh, the blanking plate, oopsie daisy, uh, which is what you'll see at the front. Uh, let me show you how that works. So here is the USB hub which we uh, cut up earlier. So this guy is going to kind of slot in like this and uh, that's it. That'll hold it in place as uh, inside the machine. So now what we need to do is attach this uh, holder to the bottom of uh, Rob here. Uh, and at first I was kind of concerned how am I going to do that because you know I, there's not actually enough space at the bottom here between um, these feet and the surface to actually hold the screw head. If you put screws here, the thing would kind of be have a bump. So couldn't use screws. So I started to wonder what I could do. Uh, luckily, I had saved this piece of uh, rob plastic from when we did the the grinding of the face. Um, and I always do that. Like if you're working with new materials that you don't understand, always save a couple of spare pieces so that you can do some testing on them. Uh, and I discovered that if you just use like regular super glue, it actually bonds. Uh, the PLA, the plastic which the printer uses, uh, to this ABS plastic really, really strongly, like uh, way stronger than we need. So I'm just going to super glue this guy in place, and then I will super glue the faceplate uh, to Rob here like this, and then everything will kind of go in. So we're going to do that right now. So now we can place the blanking plate in, and uh, that's what it's going to look like. All right, let me uh, hold this together with some tape doesn't pop open while we're trying to do our work and now I'm just going to use some super glue to attach this and I'm actually going to glue it only to the top half of this because that way uh, even with the blanking plate attached I'll still be able to take everything apart right if I glue it to the top and bottom then this will bond it shut so um, let's hope that doesn't fall so we're going to do it this way around okay okay there we go Try not to glue myself to the project, which often happens. 
uh, make sure it's straight. Um, and now we just hold that in place for a little while until it sets. Okay, next step is going to be uh, we need to take care of this giant hole where the battery uh, carrier used to be. So I printed out this blanking plate. Um, this is a really nice thing about having something like a 3D printer. You can actually just do whatever you want. So I put the embossed logo of Rabbit on there and now here we go. It's exactly the right size. So we use some super glue to uh, fix this in place and then we'll have the complete platform ready for starting to add the rest of the electronics. Okay, we're ready to do some testing. Uh, I've got here a uh, wall ward, 9 volt, uh, 500 milliamp wall ward, which we're going to use for the final project, plugged in. So I'm going to check that the wall ward is delivering the right voltage. It should be delivering basically 9 volts. Uh, if I can make contact, 9.37. Okay, find that up so you can see it better. Okay, so we have got 9.37 coming in. Uh, right now the switch is off uh, and so we should see zero entering the buck. Let's just confirm that. Input basically zero. Okay, I'm gonna flip the switch. Oh, there we go. Light came on. That's a good sign. So obviously we'll have nine volts there and on the output we have got 5.4. Okay. All right, so let's watch the eyes as I turn it on. Oh yeah, there we go. Beautiful. So now we have got power controlled by the cool retro switch. Uh, and also I've got the uh, USB part up, so wide up here. So uh, you should be able to just run the Pi off this now as well. Okay, we're ready to test for the Pi. Uh, let me set everything up. I'm gonna put one of my micro adapters onto the USB hub. Uh, I've already added the dongle for the keyboard. So this goes into the USB one. Uh, power, I'm going to put into the power one. Okay. I'm going to add HDMI. Which way around does it go? There we go. Alright, so that's all the eye stuff connected. I'll leave the, uh, this is the eyes. We'll leave that out for now. Uh, let me plug in the monitor. So we won't have sound here because this monitor doesn't have speakers, but just want to see the boots. And we plug in the, there we go. Okay, the blue light on the buck came on. That's a very good sign. And looks like we are booting. Yeah, look at that. We have got a Pi Insider Rob. Okay, it's waiting for uh, DHCP, which is networking stuff to start. There are a bunch of uh, optimizations you can do. You can configure the Raspberry Pi not to run a bunch of services, so it'll start up a lot. A lot more quickly um, but you know with all of these um, arm based emulators like the Retron 5 and everything else you, you do end up with um, with some boot time delay right it's not instantaneous the way that uh, a pure hardware console the, the original NES was all right no gamepad detected hey it even picks up the keyboard beautiful so let me configure that okay everything's glued and ready to go uh, so let me give you a quick view of how everything was arranged in the end. So at the front, of course, we've got the, uh, the USB uh, hub, which will give us our controls. And you can see that the cables for it are kind of coiled up here. And I held them in place with uh, hot glue. Uh, you don't want these cables running around loose in there because it'll make it very hard to close up again. Some people say, oh, you're using hot snot on your project. That's so cheap, man. What are you doing? Well, you know, it doesn't look pretty, but this is inside the machine. And also, it's uh, non-conductive, it's very cheap to use, and if you make a mistake, you can pull it up. So I find they're a really great product. So, you know, hey, build your projects however you like. I love the hot snot. All right, here is the Pi then. It's also glued in place with hot glue, as you can see along the seam. I've kind of glued it at an angle like this so that the plugs uh, are angled upwards. That makes it easier to plug and unplug things if we need to check something. And then on the other side of the Pi, uh, you can see right here is the system disk so you can kind of pull that out if you want to do a operating system upgrade or something it's a little tough to do but you don't do it very often uh, if you want to add games you can do that over the network or using uh, a USB disk plugged in through the front so we don't need to access that too often uh, at the back we've got the buck converter it's kind of plugged in ready to go then over here we've got that's obviously the block with the HDMI cable next to it is power then we have the switch over there 
and then above here we've got the power to the eyes going in uh, I've added tape on top of those bolts because when we close everything we don't want anything kind of making contact and short circuiting um, and that then is the project done pretty much uh, at this point on what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go and play with some of the settings uh, get it booting nice and fast and put some games on and we'll test it in its ready-to-go state Oh, huh? what? Get, what is this? Get out of here! Oh, there we go. There we go. Oh, yes. Alright, so he's running. Uh, this is the uh, main menu here. I can choose my different emulators. I can go to some uh, settings here if I want to. Um, and I've actually loaded up some uh, Super Nintendo, Atari 2600 and NES games. I'm using my uh, Xbox 360 wide controller, which is USB. It works great. So let's uh, let's play some NES. Uh, what shall we start with? Oh, Super Mario Brothers 3. That's a good choice. All right, let's see. So at this point, the emulator is running, uh, and there we go. Beautiful upscaled HDMI graphics. There we go. Rob is playing some NES. Handles really well. The graphics scale up really nicely, actually. Uh, this emulator lets you put in scan lines and stuff if you want. Uh, that's an option. So that's something you can play with. Uh, all right, so now we want to go back to menu. We push start and select simultaneously. And back here, we can change our game. Okay, given that uh, this is supposed to have the same power as a uh, Retron 5, let's see how it does on Super Nintendo games, actually. I've loaded a couple on here. Let's try Zelda. Uh, let's see. I mean, it's not the most demanding SNES game, but still. Uh, let's see how well it runs. The thing about the Raspberry Pi is it'll run it. Uh, it's just whether it runs at the right frame rate. Okay. Oh, it looks so nice. That looks pretty good, actually. Oh, it sounds great. Oh, that runs really nice, actually. Oh, it looks beautiful at this size. It's huge. Nice. We're not a grub. Go home. All right. That's pretty impressive, actually. Let's try a different game. Actually, yeah. Uh, let's try some Atari. Don't don't tell anyone we're running uh, Atari games on uh, on Rob here. We'll get into trouble. Uh, what shall we try? Pitfall. Got to be. Love this game. I mean, there is no way that this is not going to run, but, um... Oh, look at that. Man, that is cool. It's so bright. <laughs> it's just great. I always get nailed by that log. I need to figure out how to do this. Okay, fantastic. Good job, Rob. Good job. So there you go. We took a uh, broken down Rob, which wasn't working anymore. Uh, we emptied him out, we added a Raspberry Pi Zero, and now he is something useful that you can uh, not only display in your game room, but put to some good use. Um, the whole project took me about uh, probably, it was done in the space of a weekend, not working full time on it. I went out a couple of hours and did some Pokemon Go uh, during Saturday. But you know, perhaps five or six hours of full time. Uh, if you are inexperienced about how to do this stuff, it'll take a little bit longer just because, you know, things like soldering and so on will take a bit, uh, a bit of time to learn. Uh, the longest piece of the project was definitely uh, designing uh, the 3D parts. Uh, that always takes a lot of time because you've got to go do it and print a test and so on. Um, I'm sharing those uh, parts, by the way, on my Thingiverse page. I'll put a link down in the comments below. So if you want to do this build yourself, you don't have to go through a pain. You can just download the files and print them yourself. Um, and yeah, it actually was a, a super fun project. It was really nice to just kind of hack something together again instead of putting in a lot of thought about how manufacturing works and so on. Um, there are many, many details are left out of the build. I don't want to make this a long one hour, you know, boring video. Uh, but if you're interested in uh, details about how particular things were built or done, um, uh, leave it down in the comments. I'm more than happy to answer questions or uh, post follow up videos if people are interested in seeing some of those things in action. So uh, there you go. See you next time. Take care.